You're listening to Recovery Survey, the podcast that shatters stigmas around different types of addictions and takes a deep dive into spiritual principles. I find a lot of wisdom that comes from your show. You interview different people and I know you just do an overall good job and you're a blessing to recovery in general. So I want to make that very clear for the record that I love the movement that you have once you're doing, you're saving lives and you're educating and informing people. And I think that's important. I want to thank my friends at Recovery Survey for giving me the opportunity to talk to them about my recovery journey. Thank you for having me on uh, the new podcast that you just developed, which is unbelievable, Recovery Survey Podcast. I really appreciate what you're doing and, and been doing and continue doing. Our guest today is Dean H. from the UK, and he is here to talk to us about manageability and recovery. Welcome to the show, Dean. Okay, well, I'm Dean from the UK. I'm just coming up to three months sober now. Awesome. Welcome to the show, Dean. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. We spoke earlier and you said that you were interested in speaking on the subject of managing our lives once we stop using. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a great topic. Well, here's the thing. when we do step one in the 12 step program. We admit that life was unmanageable, right? Because it was, I feel like life was unmanageable when things that should have been in my control were no longer in my control. I couldn't pay rent. I couldn't make it to classes on time. I couldn't uh, keep up a relationship. I, I could barely keep up a friendship. Life was unmanageable. I couldn't stop drinking for one. That's unmanageability for you. But after getting sober and working those steps, life does become more manageable. In the uh, big book, on page 85, it tells us that the manageability, it just comes to us naturally. And manageability, it's a daily thing, right? We work this program on a daily basis, and I work the 12 steps on a daily daily basis to keep up with that unmanageability to stay in fit spiritual condition i have to tell myself that i'm an alcoholic every day i have to pray and meditate every day i have to do a daily inventory every day i have to help other people every day it's a daily contingency and that's how i stay in fit spiritual condition that's how i manage my life by integrating the 12 steps and this program into my daily life because life still goes on, right? Things still happen. Just because I become sober and I go into recovery, the things on the outside don't just stop. So I need to work together and get a balance on it, right? And it all works out. The manageability, it works in everything. In times where I couldn't do anything i was just wallowing in self-pity and useless drinking and doing drugs all the time now i can be useful to god and my fellows and that's due to keeping my life manageable one of the things that i've learned about trying to manage my life or like balance the scale so to speak is i think as long as i keep it simple mm. it seems like things work out, you know, as long as I put my recovery first, because anything I put before my recovery, I'm going to lose. As long as I put my recovery first and I try to keep it simple, to me, it seems like it's a lot easier to manage my life, you know, as long as I can prioritize that recovery and then go from there. Yeah, because when we put our recovery first, we put these steps first, everything else in a way, it just sort of seems to work, you know. And like you said, keep it simple. Just keep it in the day. Just keep it one step at a time. Yeah, keep it simple. That's a great way to manage it. Life becomes a little bit unmanageable when we start projecting fantasies and we start thinking of a, a future that hasn't even happened yet and probably never will happen. We project scenarios that 
will probably never come to be. And that's when things become a lot more complicated. So yeah, just keep it simple, keep it in the day, keep it in the moment. Yeah, I like what you said there. One thing that I've heard, and it makes sense to me, is if we put unrealistic expectations on things, that we're just setting ourselves up for future resentments. So I have to make sure to constantly remind myself to stay in the moment, you know, live just for today and not trip out about what the future holds and not put unrealistic expectations on other people and situations and things because I'm just setting myself up for failure and resentment mm. and being in a bad spot if I'm if I'm trying to predict what's going to happen. Yeah, that's the thing with expectations. We build them up so high that nothing and no one will ever truly live up to it. That's, that's why I try to just expect nothing and just take what God gives me. Because when I take my self-will back and I start to think about what's going to happen, and I start projecting those fantasies, and I start expecting too much, like you said, I'm setting myself up for resentment. I, if I expect too much from someone, which I, if I do expect something from them, I am going to expect too much from them. I'm setting myself up for resentment, and it's not good. We don't do resentments. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not a good place to be in with those resentments. And yeah, man, it makes my life really unmanageable when I'm holding on to a lot of resentments and you know a lot of hostility and. You know, it makes my life unmanageable when I'm when I'm holding on to all these resentments and especially like I guess for me I can think of examples of like holding resentments against people in my home group and you know, they probably don't even realize that I'm angry with them and I'm still thinking about some little thing they did, you know, months and months back that that just really pissed me off and you know, now I'm not listening to what they have to say when they're sharing and I'm becoming more closed minded because I have that resentment and I'm not open to hear what they have to say because I'm thinking about some little insignificant thing that they did that made me upset that I didn't like, you know, and even then, like that also makes me think of, you know, that level of arrogance that I have where, you know, I think that I'm so important and so self-righteous that, you know, people need to live up to my expectations and my standards. I'm no more important than any other person, you know, or less important. We're all equal. And so there's no reason that I should be trying to judge these people based on the standards that I have in my head. That's exactly right. You know, some, who am I to expect someone to do something that suits me? You know, who am I to expect that? I can't change people, places, and things. And like you said, we get a resentment to someone in our home group when they uh, they eat the last biscuit or something. I don't know. <laughs> Resentments, they can really creep up, you know, but that's where step 10 comes into play. In a daily inventory, we ask ourselves, are we resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? Do we owe an apology? Do I need to tell anyone something? Do I think for myself or others? What could I have done better? What did I pack for the stream of life? We ask ourselves all these things, and it keeps us in check. It keeps us to be able to manage our lives so that we can look back on that inventory and we can think, of, okay, that was an unmanageable day. What did I do wrong on that day? How do I improve on that day to make today more manageable? Absolutely. And you brought up another good point about powerlessness. You know, when I first came in, I realized that, you know, I was powerless over drugs like i knew that i couldn't stop using drugs on my own but i didn't realize how powerless i truly was i didn't realize that i was powerless over other people that i was powerless over situations and it took me a really long time and and working some steps and talking with sponsor and it took a while for me to realize that i am truly powerless and the only real power i have is over my actions I don't even have power over my own thoughts at times. You know, on occasion, I still think about using or I still think about doing something that I shouldn't do. You know, I still think about cussing somebody out or, you know, just doing something that that goes against these principles I'm trying to, to apply in my life and live. And so at the end of the day, all I have power over is how I respond to situations. But it took a long time for me to get to that point and realize just how truly powerless I am. That's true. That was great. There's a lot there. That's it. We are powerless over 
everything that isn't in our control. You know, I I think I realized how just truly powerless I was when I first got into the program, and I had about another month of relapsing, and I was trying so hard to just stop. But I kept relapsing over and over again. Every day I would swear black and blue. I, I will not drink today. I will not drink today. But I still drank that day. And I needed those experiences to just think, oh my God, I, uh, I was, I am powerless to these things. And you're right, we're still powerless over our thoughts sometimes. The only thing we have control over is our actions. Just because other things are the way they are doesn't mean we need to be that way. It's about being mindful. Mindfulness is about making sure that we're doing the right thing. Because yeah, I still get thoughts that are out of my control. Sometimes it's a nice sunny day and I'm thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice to relax in the garden with a beer? But I can't do that. Yeah, and I think that ties back into managing our lives when we realize our true powerlessness and we stop trying to control the people and the situations around us that simplifies our lives and that makes our lives more manageable because we're not trying to manipulate and try to change situations to our liking. Mm. That's what we do. We're uh, the actors in our own show. We're trying to be the director, cameraman, the actors, script writer. Pretty much we're just trying to play God and control everything that shouldn't even be in my control. At least that's what I did. I was very controlling. I tried to, um, if something didn't go my way, something that was, wasn't even in my control didn't go my way, I would dwell on it and I'd grow a resentment to it. And there's just more unmanageability. If I can't manage what I can manage, right? The small things like that should be in my control, being able to get somewhere on time or being able to just keep up a friendship, all those things that should be manageable to me. If I can't manage that, well, that's just unmanageable, isn't it, really? <laughs> and it all came from spiritual sickness and drinking and drugging. We go into these programs and we work these steps and we get a sponsor. And we do everything we've got to do so that we're restored to sanity and life can be manageable again. But just because we've worked the 12 steps, we've done what we had to do, it doesn't mean life will forever be manageable again. We have to keep doing what we're doing every single day to stay in fit spiritual condition. Because if I suddenly stop working the 12 steps, if I suddenly stop calling people, if I suddenly uh, stop reading the big book, my life will become unmanageable again. It will just spiral out of control. And then eventually, somewhere down the line, it will end up with a relapse. Yeah, and I think one of the other things, kind of going into what you just said, that, that I've come to realize is that restoration to sanity isn't just like a one-time thing. It's not like, boom, I'm restored to sanity. It's an ongoing process. And as I continue to stay in this spiritual solution and work the steps, slowly my sanity is being restored in different areas and different different parts of my life. And as, as different things are being revealed to me, it seems like the longer I stay in it, the more I become sane. Yeah. It it says that in the um ninth step promises, you know, it says these things are being fulfilled for us sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Like, and yeah, you're right. We um we don't work the five steps and then suddenly boom we are sane again. It is a daily thing. It's a, it's a, it's something we need to work on daily to make sure that we stay sane and we keep our lives manageable. Then going back to what you were talking about about being the actor and the director and the cameraman and all that. I think that's, at least for me, that was one of the hangups that I had with turning my will and my life over to a higher power is I was already trying to fill that role of God in my life. So it was difficult for me to step aside and let someone or something else fill that spot because I, I had such a big ego that you know, I, I thought I was already doing a pretty good job when clearly I wasn't because I was coming in to the rooms and my life was unmanageable and my life was a mess. And But it was really hard for me to let go of that 
control because I thought I was doing an okay job at it. When I realized that my self-will was completely just gone, when I realized that if someone put a, a beer in front of me and I wouldn't be able to say no, that's when I realized my self-control was truly gone and I realized I needed something more powerful, more greater than me to help me. And that's, I feel like that's the moment when I, when I let go, when I accepted the fact that I used to think, like you said about ego, I used to think so highly of myself. I had such a high ego. I thought I was God. But if I'm so almighty and powerful, why can't I go a day without drinking? Why, why can't I say no to the next drink or the next joint? And when I accepted that, I did the uh, step three prayer. That's when I managed to hand my will and my life over to God. There's lots of different powers that are greater than me. The group is a power greater than me. You know, the literature is a power greater than me. You know, there's all these different things. Drugs were a power greater than me because they had taken over my life and I couldn't control them. You know, looking back at it now, it's crazy for me to think that, you know, I had everything under control and, you know, have that ego of thinking I am God when clearly there's all these other things that are in my life that are greater than me. When, when I first got into the program, things started slowly get a little bit more manageable. I mean, just just getting to a meeting on time shows manageability. Yeah, the power of a room, that is definitely great. I mean, it is, I really can't explain that, but when I'm in a room, I just, I, I can feel it. I don't know if you get that as well. It's, just, it's something just very spiritual. It's just a, a very strong feeling, strong connection within a room. I like that. I love what you said that. All of these things are a power greater than me. Alcohol was definitely a power greater than me because it took over my entire life. It became my entire life. It became what I, it's what I obsessed over. It's what I did all the time. Uh, I cared about it more than other people. I cared about it more than anything. I cared what, I cared about it more than me. So yeah, I like what you said there. You brought up a good point about showing up to meetings on time. I think that's one of the pieces of having a manageable life because for the longest time before I was in the rooms, I didn't have any kind of structure. I didn't have any kind of schedule. I just did whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. And now that I'm working a program, you know, I have, I have some of those responsibilities that are coming back. You know, I have a job now. I have to show up on time, I have responsibilities of my home group that I have to take care of. Like, I'm getting structure in my life and that I think that's one piece of manageability is having a schedule and having structure in my life. When we first get into this, we start responsibility starts coming back. We realize that we need to get better at managing things. Timing is a huge one. Like you said, I just did whatever, whenever it suited me. I would drink all night, sleep all day wake up about uh, 4, 5 p.m. Um, and then get back out straight to it. I used to think that was normal because, uh, you know, people normally start drinking about 5 p.m. So if I woke up at 5 p.m. and start drinking, it's normal, right? Because everyone else is drinking at that time. Yeah, then that, that brings in a whole other aspect, though, because as, as we start to get these responsibilities back and we start being productive members of society and working and having responsibilities and rebuilding those relationships with our families and and stuff like that it seems like as our lives get busier it also has a tendency to become unmanageable again i can only speak for me but you know now that i've been clean for a little while i have a lot of stuff going on in my life i have a lot of things um that take up time in my life and so i can still allow it to be unmanageable if i don't try to stick to a schedule and prioritize things and it can be really overwhelming. That's right. That's where um, the balance comes into it, you know, because we still have a lot on our plate. There's still there's jobs, family, whatever it is you do. That's still all a thing. So obviously, you have to work this program and integrate it into your daily life, but you still need to find a balance of living because we we do this to have a life. We work this program to have a life. We don't work this program to 
continuously like this program. But it can definitely be tricky to find that balance. And I still have to put my recovery at the top because if I let myself get so busy and distracted by all these other things and I'm not doing stuff for my recovery that, you know, just the, the basic things that I was taught, you know, going to meetings and calling my sponsor or doing step work, that kind of stuff, you know, eventually I'm going to lose all these things that I've got in the process of living this new way of life. So I still have to put an importance on those things. But at the same time, like you were saying, I can also take it to an extreme because I have that, that obsessive and compulsive personality that we have is as addicts and I can make going to meetings, I can make that unmanageable in my life by going to so many meetings that, I mean, it, it can get out of hand. I've heard a few people say this in the past. I'm not sure if it's true, but people say that when we first get into recovery, we become addicted to recovery. <laughs> to a level, it might be true, you know, maybe I did. You know, when I first got into recovery, I started going to meetings, sometimes twice a day, non-stop uh working this program all the time but i definitely put recovery first 100 <laughs> percent. but when i put recovery first i put all of my other responsibilities to the side and that's the thing there's a difference between putting recovery first and everything else second and putting recovery first and putting everything else at the bottom of the list on that as well on unmanageability if i find that i sometimes work this program too little then things start to become a little bit more unmanageable again it is weird if, if a day goes by where i don't pray or i don't meditate suddenly that that day it might not be as good as a different day and maybe something bad happens in that day maybe my conscious contact with god is not very strong that day and i do something unfit like lash out or say some snarky to someone i don't know but little things can creep up on us it's all about finding that balance it can be difficult though it can be very difficult I, there are probably still people who are very far into recovery and they still struggle with it i mean here's a perfect scenario maybe let's say you're chairing a meeting so you're pre you, you have a pretty important role at this certain meeting. But then something personal is also going to occur at the same time in this meeting. Then you have to sort of think about which one you're going to do. That plays very much into the balance. Another thing that plays into the balance is your personal life. Because obviously, if someone, if someone was close to you, a friend, a family, or husband, wife, whatever, it's pretty damn obvious you had a problem. It was for me. I was in no way good at hiding my drinking or drugs. I was not good at hiding it at all. So suddenly when I stopped, people were like, why did you stop? What, what, what happened? How did, how did you just stop? And I'm like, oh, well, I got into a 12-step program. You know, I, started, I, joined, I joined a fellowship that helps people with the condition I and then they go, oh, okay, that's interesting. Tell me more about it. And you start just explaining what it's about. Maybe they ask a few questions. And the next thing you know, you've spent three hours talking nonstop about a program, but they don't even need. I don't know. I guess I talk about it so much because I'm just so grateful for it that I now have my life back. Now it, my life is manageable again. I owe a lot to this program. I owe a lot to um, the big one. I owe a lot to everyone, really. <laughs> I guess just talking about it a lot just shows that uh, I'm passionate about it. But you know, yeah, there's there's a balance and there's definitely a time to talk about this stuff and there's time not to talk about this stuff. Yeah, I think I think we have a lot of gratitude for for the program and that's part of the reason that we want to share it with other people is because we've seen we've seen the positive effects of it in our lives. And so we want to share it with other people in hopes that they can have the same results and that if they if they work a program that they can find that freedom that we found that's such a big part of my life because without it, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today. You know, my life is totally different today because of the program. So, yeah, it's hard not to share that and let people know like, hey, there's another way to do this and you don't have to 
drink or get high anymore. You know, you can live, you can live a life and be happy and not have to use. Yeah. It's crazy to think that life can actually be enjoyable without being completely messed up in the head. What? People have fun without being drunk or high? Such a weird thought, but <laughs> we we'll just start to do it. And even in moments that have nothing to do with alcohol or drugs for me, um, I'm just generally having a good time sober, the thought comes into my head, oh wow, I can have fun without being messed up. And then again, I start thinking about the program, I start thinking about recovery. It's, it's something that's on my mind every waking moment of my life. Because without this program, I wouldn't be here now. And I owe a lot to it. I, I, I talk about it because it's got me where I am today. It's made life more manageable again. I started drinking when I was 11 years old, right? So right away, you know, no 11-year-old has many responsibilities. You wake up, you go to school, you go home, you have your dinner, you watch TV, you go to bed. That's your entire life right there. I did not have much responsibility. So straight away into my drinking, it's not like I had any experience and responsibility anyway. So I pretty much fucked up every bit of responsibility I ever had over the years that came my way. Every time I was trusted with something, I, I always screwed up. I mean, for God's sake, I had a job where I worked with children and I would show up to the job drunk. That just shows just how unmanageable I was. That shows how little responsibility I had. But now, in recovery, I'm slowly getting used to things. You know, even even small things. When I'm someone asks me to go and get the weekly shop from a shop, you know, the weekly groceries. That's a huge step. No one would have done that in in the past. They would have been scared that I would spend all the money on drink so it's it's little small victories that make us just go oh wow it's it's like a reminder that life has become more that you've got a better grasp on life now yeah exactly i feel like i've um i've said my part on manageability you know to, to sum it up life wasn't manageable and by working the 12 steps with a sponsor by reading pages 1 to 164 in the big book, life has become more manageable. To anyone who's listening who is in a, that dark spot where things are unmanageable, well, first of all, well done for coming to this podcast. If you want a life beyond your wildest dreams, then you do the work. The spiritual toolkit's right there. You, you, you get a sponsor and you get a big book. Absolutely, man. I love it. It's simple. So we make it complicated. Don't make it complicated. That's it. Like, like you said earlier, just keep it simple. The, the 12 steps are not complicated. Step one, admit that our lives were unmanageable, we were powerless. Step two, come to believe the power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. Step three, to hand my will and life over to that God. Step four, pretty much just record my past discretions. Step five, admit that to myself, God, and another human being. Step six and seven is to come to terms with my character defects and ask God to take them away. Eight and nine, to make amends to all the people I've hurt. Ten, just to continue to take daily inventory, to stay on top of managing our lives, to keep making sure our lives are managed. Step eleven, to pray, meditate, to, uh, increase our conscious contact with God. And step 12, just help other people to pass the message on to the new one. It's, it's a really simple program. Just don't overcomplicate it. Absolutely, man. Do you want to give people any kind of way to contact you or like Instagram, Twitter, anything like that? Yeah, sure. I run a Instagram page for young alcoholics and addicts whether you're run, you're young or not you can still contact it it's um at young underscore alcoholics underscore addicts that's on instagram always active on there but if you don't want to reach out to me personally that's fine you can 
go to Google and just simply type in whatever program you feel like you need, just look for support and you'll come across it. There are, no matter where you go in, in the entire world, there will be a meeting somewhere close to you. <laughs> so if you're seeking help and you're seeking support, it's there. Well, Dean, I appreciate you taking time and, and sharing with us. Well, thank you for having me on it. Great. Thanks so much, man. Thank you so much, Dean. You had a lot of great things to share with us. If you would like to get in contact with Dean, you can find him on Instagram at young underscore alcoholics underscore addicts. You've been listening to Recovery Survey. If you got anything out of today's episode, I'd ask you to please leave us a five-star review and share this episode with a friend. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can find us at recoverysurvey.com. You can listen to all of our episodes on the website as well as connect with us on social media where you can get previews for upcoming episodes.